Facing seven to one odds, most pilots would cut and run. Not Rickenbacker. He climbs following Volca's first rule. He comes out of the sun, that's important. He has the sun to his back and they can't see him. As the enemy formation passes, Rickenbacker idles his engine. It allows him to attack silently and eliminates the vibration from the engine that's so violent it can ruin the pilot's aim. Rickenbacker noses down in a steep dive. He realizes that he has a chance to attack from the rear quarter. Uh, he chooses to uh, pursue his attack on the uh, tail end Charlie or that last spotting aircraft, that Falker. Rickenbacker employs Volka's fifth rule, attack the exposed six o'clock. The Falker spots Rickenbacker. Too late. Rickenbacker opens fire with his two Vickers 30 caliber machine guns. The four remaining Falkers, stunned at Rickenbacker's sudden attack, scatter. They know they've been attacked, but not from where or by how many. It'll take them time to discover there's only one enemy. Time for their leader, with no radio and only hand signals, to reform the group. So he realizes now they're no longer going to be a factor to him. So he then chooses to go ahead and continue on to attack those reconnaissance aircraft. As the Fokkers splinter, they leave the LVGs unprotected. The LVGs spot Rickenbacker and make a run for it. They dive for safety. The planes draw apart. The rear gunners fire, but Rickenbacker is out of range. Rickenbacker dives to get out of the line of fire. His dive takes him under the Germans. He zooms up to attack the nearest plane's vulnerable belly. The nearest LVG kicks his tail around, giving his gunner a clear shot at Rickenbacker. Then the second LVG steals in on Rickenbacker's tail, spitting a deadly stream of machine gun bullets at his span. Rickenbacker's caught in lethal crossfire and in grave danger. September 25th, 1918, American ace Eddie Rickenbacker, behind enemy lines, has attacked seven German aircraft. He's taken out one Fokker, causing the fighter escort to splinter. He presses his attack on two heavily armed LVG observation planes. The four remaining Fokkers are still trying to regroup. As the LVGs fire, tracer bullets streak past Rickenbacker's cockpit. So now Captain Rickenbacker has to find a way to maneuver his aircraft and put to a position where the LVGs can't shoot. Pretty tough. Rickenbacker zooms upward to gain altitude and get out of range. Then he rolls over and dives down to attack the nearest LVG. The LVG carries a 7.92 millimeter parabellum machine gun. It can fire 700 rounds per minute, 200 rounds faster than the SPAD or the Fokker, giving the LVG a greater chance to hit its mark. These two-seaters were very, very dangerous. They were as dangerous as a single-seater Fokker. The fire of the LVGs thwart one attack. Rickenbacker, ignoring the danger, repeats his tactic and dives under the LVG to set up his attack and get out of the line of fire. He climbs to strike the LVG's vulnerable belly, but the LVG's heavy crossfire forces him to roll over the top and dive to attack again. The Germans are expert warriors. The Germans were particularly skilled in the dogfight. You just didn't realize the environment you were getting into. Most of their fighter pilots had extensive experience flying two-seaters on the Russian front. As you also might expect, the Germans saw fighting as a duty. The World War I German pilots were very effective, amazing amount of kills. 
they were fighting over their homeland. They actually started teaching tactics. I'd imagine that's part of the reason why they became so effective. The LVG again sideslips, allowing the rear gunner a clean shot at Rickenbacker. Again, Rickenbacker is forced to climb, roll, and die for another assault. But the Germans pull the same defense, and Rickenbacker is caught in the crossfire. Then, the LVGs suddenly, inexplicably, make a fatal mistake. On the fourth pass, for reasons which no one will ever know, the two LVGs separated and gave him some space. Out of the crossfire, Rickenbacker uses the opening to attack the nearest LVG. The Fokker escorts have regrouped and tear to the rescue of the surviving LVG. Rickenbacker sees the Fokkers diving toward him and decides two kills is enough. The four Fokker D7s did not follow him. That's not unusual for either side to say the fight is over and we've had enough. He has faced seven to one odds, destroyed two of the enemy, and escaped to fight again. I came out of World War I without a single scratch. There were more than 150, I would say 160 encounters with the enemy out of which I got 26 victories. His action of September 25th will win him the Congressional Medal of Honor. I knew that I wanted to be like him. And he was, he was my knight in shining armor from the time I was about eight years old. Rickenbacker writes, courage is doing what you're afraid to do. There can be no courage unless you're scared. I interviewed a World War I ace, a guy who was 92, and I asked him uh, one time, I said, you ever get nightmares? He said, yeah, I do. I said, when was the last time you had one? He said, last night. And I thought they'd kind of faded away with time, but they don't. The tactics pioneered by the pilots of World War I stand the test of time and the march of technology. No matter how advanced their weapon systems or aircraft become, the tactics that you know, Rickenbacker and Bulky and those guys developed in World War I are still applicable today. By World War II, just over 20 years later, the fighter has evolved into a powerful weapon more than 300 miles per hour faster than the span. The changes between World War I fighters and World War II was power. We now have aircraft that have more horsepower, they can go faster, they can go higher. Uh, they also carry better weapon systems. They carry more guns with longer range, more ammo, and a bigger punch than the SPAD's two 30 caliber machine guns. Faster planes and deadlier weapons mean less time to react, less margin for error. The skies of the Second World War will be far more lethal than the first. Since 1943, the Americans have sent massive daylight bombing raids into the heart of Germany beyond the range of fighter escort. The heavily armed bombers are expected to defend themselves against swarms of enemy fighters. The daylight raids proved to be uh, quite unsuccessful and we suffered some heavy losses, losing as many as almost 60 bombers during one mission. The losses mounted. September 6, 1943, 45 B-17s destroyed. October 14, 1943, 65 B-17s destroyed by 1,100 German fighters. The Air Force called it Black Thursday. 600 men went down on that day, and it almost put an end to the daylight bombing. They said, now we've got to have fighter escort. You know, we just can't do this without it. 